Well, as I'm sure that you recognized, we just heard from the Sermon on the Mount, the most famous sermon that's ever been preached. And those were the opening verses of that sermon that takes up three chapters in Matthew's Gospels, chapter 5, 6, and 7. Those early verses are called the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes are among the most beloved and beautiful expressions of spiritual insight and truth uh, that, that we have in the Bible. I would, I would rank it up there alongside of um, Psalm 23 for Christians, uh, where the Lord teaches us the Lord's Prayer, uh, maybe the 13th chapter of Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Uh, and I think its reputation for lyrical beauty is well-deserved. But, but here's the, the larger point that I want to make up front. I want to set the sermon in its context. Because you need to remember that the very first thing that Jesus does when he bursts on the scene at the beginning of the Gospels to launch his mission to save the world is a proclamation. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near, which is the rule of God is now present here on earth as it is above. And so what follows from that point forward in the Gospels is, what does it look like? What does it look like if you step into the touch point of where heaven touches down on earth? We pray as he taught us, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Well, it has come on earth as it is in heaven. It's come in Jesus. And so again, the question is, what does it look like to come into the touch point where Jesus brings the kingdom of heaven down to earth and the Sermon of the Mount is an answer to that question. So today we are with Jesus on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee, high up in the hills overlooking that beautiful broad lake below. And in the section that immediately precedes, that comes before the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is not only proclaiming that the kingdom of heaven has come, he's demonstrating that the kingdom of heaven has come. We're told of all kinds of healings of various sundry sorts and conditions of people around the lake. They're healings of various diseases, physical pain, epilepsy, people who are paralyzed, casting out demonic spirits. And this attracts, as you would understand, enormous attention. People are hearing about this, and people from all around the surrounding regions are wanting to come and, and see this this person by whose reputation these extraordinary things are happening. So Jesus sees the masses coming to him around the Sea of Galilee and he goes up on the mountain to speak to them. Just like Moses is called up Mount Sinai in the book of Exodus to deliver the shape of the covenant relationship with God that is delivered in the law. So Jesus, the new Moses, is called up a Galilean mountain to deliver the shape of the new covenant relationship that is defined by himself in his own life and body. And here's how I suggest that you might want to imagine the scene. All those people in the previous chapter that Jesus has touched and healed, they're there in the crowd. They are relative nobodies, by the way, according to worldly standards. And they're at his feet as well as these much larger crowds that are now sort of spilling down the mountainside. And he sees these people that he's already touched he knows them. And for the sake of the, the new masses who haven't seen any of his miracles yet, he kind of addresses this sermon by pointing them out. Like, there's somebody I healed. Blessed, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, like this one right here that I know, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, you back there. I've already had an encounter with you for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for, for they will be filled over here. Look, these people are right here amongst us. They are just like you, and they are the kinds of people I am describing. Without any resources of their own, they have been touched by the kingdom of heaven. Look at them, and you can be too. That's what I want for you. Blessed. What, what is it to be blessed? The Greek word here is makarios. It's often translated just like that, blessed, sometimes happy, 
uh, fortunate, well-off, have a blessed day, have a nice day. It's a much richer, deeper sense here in the Gospels. The better sense of what it is to be blessed is to be filled with life, abundant life, the life for which Jesus came and died, the abundant life for which we were created in the first place. That's what it means. So I want to just focus on the very first of those Beatitudes that I read from the gospel. Coming first, I want to suggest to you that it is foundational to all the rest that follow. The first step, the first step in coming into the the fullness of life, the abundant life that God wants for us is found in these words. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So how ironic that the path into the abundant life takes us through poverty, poverty of spirit. The scholar and Christian writer, uh, now deceased, Dallas Willard, has been enormously helpful to me in um, thinking about this first beatitude. He says that it may be among the most deeply cherished of all the words of Jesus and at the same time among the most easily misunderstood of all the words of Jesus because it's possible to hear this, and I think we have heard it this way before, maybe even I have taught and preached it this way before, is what Jesus is really saying is just be humble, poor in spirit, uh, Humility is something to be admired. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Again, I wonder sometimes if we've heard that verse and think that's the call. Like, hey, hey, don't be spiritually proud. Don't be self-righteous. Uh, don't place any pride in your accomplishments or who you think you are or your performance. That's not the way to blessedness. Be humble and kind, poor in spirit. Um, when I was in Nashville, occasionally... Um, country music stars would come and worship at our church. Tim McGraw and Faith Hill, you may not know who they are, but they're kind of a big deal in country music. And, um, and they would come from time to time. I'm sure they went every Sunday somewhere, but some, sometimes they would come to our church. Uh, and that always predisposed me to like them, <laughs> like their recordings, like their songs. Tim McGraw had a song that he recorded a few years ago called Humble and Kind, Here's a lyric from that song. Hold the door, say please, say thank you. Don't steal, don't cheat, don't lie. I know you got mountains to climb, but always stay humble and kind. We might hear that. That's, that's lovely. Filled with folksy wisdom. Just, just preach that. We could all stand a lot more humility and kindness in our world today. But the news in just recent days from Memphis to Jerusalem to Ukraine to other places around the world tell us that we need a lot more than humility and kindness. We certainly need nothing less than that. But the human condition is so broken, so disordered, and often violently against itself that we need a savior. We just don't have the resources in our own strength to fix the core problems of sin that disrupt our own lives and the social order. It should be abundantly clear to us. Now we're getting close to what Jesus is talking about. The Greek word here for poor, it's not just having few possessions. It means utterly destitute. In spirit, therefore, is to be utterly destitute of our own spiritual resources. To be at the place where we understand that we have no spiritual resources of our own that can fix ourselves and fix the world. We are utterly and only dependent on the spiritual resources of God. To recognize that beggarly spiritual condition is not to denigrate who we are. Not at all, in fact. But it is to turn to God, to come to the place where we confess that God, if there is anything that can can change us and change our world, it has to be up to you. Try as I might on my own. And this is where Jesus finds us, where the kingdom touches down in our midst, in our lives, in our hearts. Because we are there, confessionally, in the place where we are most likely to hear the voice of Jesus speaking to us saying, you don't think I already know that? 
I love you, and I love you so much. Your spiritual poverty is never enough to keep me from coming to you again and again. I got this. That's why I'm here. I got it. Blessed are you if you understand that and accept that. From time to time, maybe once or twice a year, I'm going to probably feel healthy if I remember before you my own adult conversion. I was a good little Christian boy growing up through adolescence and my teenage years. Went off to college and the wheels fell off the wagon. And I was at my lowest point morally, spiritually, uh, in June 1987, I was working in the mountains of North Carolina. I hit a relative rock bottom, and I knew it. I'd been there, but I became awake to it. I'd been living an utterly hedonistic life, utterly selfish in my relationships, utterly irresponsible in what I was called to do and to be, and utterly comatose to God. And I confessed in that night that I was, I was tired. I might have even been a little depressed. Without a bright future, without any way out of the hole that I dug for myself that I could possibly see, God, if, there's, if, you're, if you are out there, and oh my gosh, I'm actually talking to God again. And it was that night that my soul looked up and I saw Jesus, not God my Father, but Jesus my Savior, arms outstretched, forgiveness offered and assured, and a purpose given back into my life changed everything. Blessed are the poor in spirit. So what I want to tell us today and say in a mirror as well is that the call is not to try harder to be humble in spirit. That can in its way become a kind of moralism or legalism. We, we seem to have plenty of that already. We're not blessed because we are poor in spirit. We are blessed in spite of being poor in spirit. That's the good news. Being poor in spirit does not make us worthy of blessedness in the kingdom of heaven. Only Jesus makes us worthy of blessedness in the kingdom of heaven. But only those spiritually destitute enough to realize this come into the full blessedness that is intended for us, this intersection of heaven and earth. And just a quick additional anecdote. When I was uh, leading a men's discipleship group week after week in another church far away, um, there was a, a friend in this group who would show up almost every week because part of what we did was check in on each other. What's God been doing in your life this week? How have you been responding to God this week? And he would come in sort of beating his chest. Once again, I didn't do the reading I didn't pray enough. I, I'm not loving enough to my wife, my children, and my dog. I'm not nice enough to people I work with. I just, I, oh, next week I'm going to try harder. It was like he was reaching into his spiritual clothing for, for resources and pulling out little lint balls. And we all wanted to say, and I think we often did say, that's it. You're there. <laughs> You're in the place where God can touch you most powerfully. Just give it up. None of us have the spiritual resources on our own. Lay it down. You don't have the capacity to work your way into abundant life. And all you're doing is making yourself feel more and more guilty, inadequate to the life of the faith. And I encounter that over and over and over in my pastoral ministry in the church, including here. Jesus says again, I already know this about you. Do you think that in any way stops me from loving you? I came to save you anyway. You have nothing to offer me on your own. But you do have this tendency, he might say to us, to assume that the path to the happy life, the fortunate life, the blessed life, the abundant life is going to be the product of your own performance, your own righteousness, your own will. But hear me clearly, grace does not work through the will. Grace works through Jesus entering into our hearts. And then it may change our will. So I want to stress this important point. The Sermon on the Mount is not a list of ethical requirements that you are called to tick off. It is a vision of Jesus at the intersection of heaven and earth, even now among us. 
The Sermon on the Mount cannot be separated from the preacher. He is the source of blessedness and he alone. And in coming to us the way he comes to us and living and dying and rising again, Jesus is demonstrating for us, giving us the gift of freedom from all those things that we may assume bring blessedness and the abundant life. And I want to say that in a social context like St. John the Divine, that would be freedom from, again, living as if blessedness and happiness were achieved through our own personal resources. Try as we do. In Jesus, we find rest from that. We can rest from, from that. He says elsewhere, come unto me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. One of the heavy burdens that we carry in a place like this is to think it is up to us and our resources and what we achieve, performance, spirituality. Not so. So this is the day of our annual parish meeting wherein we look at what God is doing among us, how we're responding, and what we envision God might want to do even more as we look to our future. And I just have to think that when God collects people like us, people with all the, the earthly resources that we have here, when people with all of that truly accept that our ultimate blessedness is not found in that, but is found elsewhere in Him, well, then that collection of people that He's called together will radiate with the glory of His grace in ever more powerful ways. And it will be impossible to hide the light that is the Church of St. John the Divine, as impossible as it is to hide a city on a hill. Amen.